Well, good morning, church, or good day, or good evening, whenever you're watching this. Uh, welcome to our service today, where we are closing out our Rule of Life series, which has all been about trying to actively push back against the unique, uh, specific pressures and temptations in our current cultural context and so we've looked at the subject of of time and money and our mind and media and our will and decision making and the issue of power and and servanthood and today we're going to close out this series talking uh, more generally about the subject of community and I thought that was quite providential that uh, initially we had planned the series that community had come up on the eve of us about to be going back into real life gathered church community next week Sunday which I got to tell you I am so excited for and so just want to, in case you haven't heard I know you've heard it already but I'm just so excited about it I'll just keep repeating it to you any chance that I get the church is opening again for in-person worship next week at 8 o'clock at 10 15 and a 5 o'clock service I would love to see you there if you're comfortable and able to come hey uh, in order to pull it off we're still looking for uh, just people to help out we have to to do three services to try and cater because we're limited to a hundred people and so we need more guys just serving at the doors uh, health checks uh, tech team etc so if you want to help us bring people back together then uh, please join us and serve that's what we spoke about last week servanthood I didn't talk about serving at the church which of course is a way that we practice servanthood in the church so on to today where we're talking uh, as I said the idea was to talk uh, about community but actually what I want to do this morning is is narrow that down and talk about a specific related topic uh, to community. So you might remember last year when we were journeying towards coming back together, we did a little sermon series called the One Another Series, which we spoke a lot about Christian community. So what I want to talk about today is something that I believe is one of the most important ideas that we as Christians should be pursuing today. And I mean, it's one of the most important ideas that we should be pursuing today. And it is the very simple subject of hospitality. That's right, hospitality. See, in a culture of individualism, loneliness, isolation, in particular now, and also in a culture of tribalism, suspicion, and a lot of hostility and animosity between people, there is perhaps no better witness to the love of God as demonstrated in Jesus than the simple practice of hospitality. Now, you may think, hey, that sounds like a little bit of an overstatement. And that might be because when I say the word hospitality, uh, one of two ideas comes to mind. On the, on, the, on the one side, when you think hospitality, you think of the multi-million rand industry in our country, hotels and food service industry. When you think hospitality, you think that. Or on the other end of the spectrum, when you think hospitality, you think about having somebody over for a nice cup of tea and scones and you pull out your fine china. Well, in the Bible, the subject of hospitality is a lot bigger than both of those ideas. So Rosaria Butterfield wrote a book, I think it came out last year, called The Gospel Comes with a House Key on the subject of hospitality. And she talks about biblical hospitality like this. She says, being hospitable in a post-Christian world means meeting strangers and making them neighbors and, by God's grace, welcoming neighbors into the family of God. And I think that's a great definition because the focus is on strangers, and we're going to talk about that today, but also the intention behind it is drawing people into the family of God. And you can see this definition when you simply look at the word 
hospitality when it comes up in particular in our New Testament. So the word behind it in the Greek text, so translated hospitality, uh, is this word xenophilia. Xenophilia. And you don't have to be a Greek scholar, I think, to get a sense of what this word means. If you've been around church for a little bit, uh, then you might know what philia means. It, it means love. So Philadelphia is love of brothers and sisters. So it's love of Christians between one another. Philadelphia. So philia is love. If you've been around church, you've heard that a thousand times. Zeno, I mean, if you've just kind of you know, paid attention to what happens in our country, you know, Zeno means, because you know what xenophobia means. So xenophobia, phobia is fear. Xenophobia is fear of the foreigner or fear of the stranger. So xenophilia is the opposite of xenophobia. It is instead of a fear and hostility towards the foreigner or the stranger, it is a love of the stranger, or the foreigner, or the outsider, those not like you. That's what the biblical definition of hospitality means. So let me give you some ideas as this comes up in the New Testament. So, for example, Hebrews 13 verse 2 is a popular passage speaking of hospitality because uh, it says quite uh, mysteriously, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers for thereby some have entertained angels unawares which is really just quite mysterious and motivation enough. Hey, be hospitable because you never know. Maybe that person you're reaching out to is an angel uh, in disguise as a human being, all quite strange. Where does that come from? Well, Genesis 18 is often kind of the story that's probably shaped this, where Abraham... Um, as he's out in his tent, he welcomes in three travelers, so three strangers, and they just lay on the hospitality and give them food and a meal and are welcoming. And turns out those three strangers are three angels who then give the promise, hey, despite your age, you're going to have a child. And so that's often the story behind this Hebrews 13 verse 2 is that these angels dressed as people and Abraham was hospitable towards them. Uh, and similarly, but even in a more weighty sense, uh, comes Matthew 25. And, and Matthew 25 that doesn't use the word hospitality, but it's Jesus speaking. It's the same idea. Now, if you've been a Christian for a while, Matthew 25 is just a key passage. It's when Jesus has come back again, has returned, and he's kind of judging the world in the final judgment. So we pay attention to this passage. He has separated people, those that are coming with him to his eternal kingdom, and those that are excluded from his eternal kingdom. And he describes how that division is made. So we know this passage, we've paid attention to it. Uh, but he says this, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Beautiful. And he says, Because I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. And you'll know the disciples are like, but hey, or the people who have been welcomed into his eternal kingdom, like, hey, when did we do that? And he says, when you did it to the least of me, at least of those, you did it to me. And then he says this, which is a part I've often missed, to often pay attention to the hungry and feeding them and the thirsty. But Jesus also says this, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. You extended hospitality to others. You were doing it to me, which kind of takes the whole idea of entertaining angels to another level. I can't remember where, but I remember the story about St. Benedict. It was one of the first uh, to kind of institute a kind of rule of life yeah, for some of his followers. And his very first rule was a rule of hospitality. And the story goes of an old Benedictine monk 
who was about to lock the monastery door at night, on Sunday night after a busy weekend, lots of guests, troublesome guests who were difficult to handle. And so he was secretly glad to see everybody go so that he could just like lock up and have a bit of a rest, right? Like every introvert everywhere after every kind of party. So he's locking the doors. And as he's locking the doors to the monastery, a new group of pilgrims walk up and asked to be admitted <laughs> into the monastery. And so under his breath, the story goes, this monk said to himself, Lord Jesus Christ, is it you again? Right, this idea of practicing hospitality, you don't know who you're entertaining. So all I have to say, there's clearly a weight given to hospitality in the New Testament and by Jesus himself in that Matthew 25 passage, which is why it's no surprise that the characteristic of being hospitable is on the list of requirements for elders in a church. Both 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, passages that describe what elders should be like, both those lists specifically mention they should be hospitable. Which, if we're honest, when we are kind of electing elders, we don't often pay attention to that. We pay attention to the others. We want to make sure that their family life is in order. They're not drunks. They can handle the Word of God. We don't often ask them about their practice of hospitality. As it turns out, as I've experienced, we have a group of elders who are particularly hospitable, but that's just often not on our list of character requirements for those who lead God's church. One more passage that I believe gives the subject of hospitality even greater weight at these times is 1 Peter chapter 4, which in fact we came across in our little One Another series last year, so you may remember it. It says this, verse 7 to 9. Peter says, The end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Then it says this, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Now, I love that passage because it's clearly a passage about kind of the end times. And if again, if you've been around church for a little bit, then you know how the Bible speaks about the end times is it's kind of this t a time of immense disturbance, cosmic disruption. So the whole natural creative order is collapsing. So earthquakes, uh, pandemics. There's the natural order is collapsing, but there's also all sorts of lawlessness and evil is kind of expanding at a prolific rate. That's how the end is described in the Bible. And this passage is telling us how to live in light of the end. And so it's stunning to me that in light of the end, practice hospitality. And I, th I think, well, we've got to back up there and hear this a little bit because that does not intuitively make sense. Right, if the world is going crazy and Jesus is coming back in the midst of that, what, what do you need me to do? You mean I need to go break out the baking powder, make some scones? Because, you, you know, it just doesn't seem to make sense. Except if you realize the missional impact of hospitality. And so I've kind of given you a biblical definition of the idea, and I want to talk about the missional impact of simple hospitality, because that's why Peter is saying in light of the end, especially be hospitable. So I've heard it said before, and I think this is such an important statement. I've heard it said before that the kind of atheism that we experience today is not a conclusion, but a mood. Let me say that again. The kind of atheism that we mostly experience today is not a conclusion, 
but a mood. And so in order to disrupt atheism, you can't do that with an argument. To disrupt the mood of atheism, you've got to do that with a new kind of mood. A disruptive presence that changes the mood. And I would argue that practicing a culture, making a habit of hospitality, where we deliberately extending friendship and serving those outside of our ordinary circles of community will be the presence that disrupts the mood of atheism. In other words, I would honestly say this, one of our most evangelistic pursuits today could simply be practicing hospitality. So David Mathis, scholar and author, he, he says this, in a progressively post-Christian society, the importance of hospitality as an evangelistic asset is growing rapidly. I agree. Increasingly, the most strategic turf on which to uh, engage the unbelieving with the good news of Jesus may be the turf of our own homes. When people don't gather in droves for stadium crusades or hang around long enough on the sidewalk, sidewalk to hear your gospel spill, then what will you do? Where will you interact with the unbelieving? About the things that matter most. And the argument is around the table in your own home through the practice of hospitality. And church, I really want to say this. It may seem like such a simple subject, such a small idea. Do not underestimate today the missional impact of simple hospitality. I mean, I say today in the current climate, mood, post-Christian society, but actually, it's always been this way. It's always had this massive missional impact. Let's have a look again at the story from Matthew chapter 9. So that passage that Christine read before the sermon. Let's go back there. Let's just read that important story again. So Matthew 9, I'm going to read from verse 9 to 13. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting there with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to Jesus' disciples, Why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Now you go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So much I want to talk about in that story that we're going to get to talk about. But first up, Jesus calls as a disciple a tax collector. And I'm sure you've reflected on that a few times before, but it's still stunning every time I read it. Tax collectors, the most hated uh, part of the Jewish community. They were Jewish people who worked for the Romans and who often extorted their fellow Jewish brothers and sisters for their own materialistic gains. They were also considered ritually unclean because of their constant contact with the Gentile Romans. But Jesus calls tax collector to follow him, and he does. And then this tax collector, uh, who's likely now the author of this gospel we're reading, right, Matthew, has a massive party at his house. And Jesus and his disciples are there. And he invites all his friends, what the text describes as, get this, tax collectors and sinners. Tax collectors, outcasts, and sinners. And that combination is important because it's painting the picture of social outcasts. That's who Jesus 
is hanging out with around a table. And the religious leaders of the time just can't understand this. And we often kind of beat on the Pharisees as we read their responses. But, but you know, a Jewish rabbi at this time was trained to stay away from people who were unclean. Right? In their own texts, it says, for example, this, Keep thee far from an evil neighbor and consort not with the wicked. That's how they were trained. Which doesn't make sense if you think about the fact, maybe you never thought about this, but if you think about the fact that even the religious leaders of Jesus' time, the Jewish leaders, also wanted to make converts. Right? They were also trained to make converts themselves. So how do you make that convert introduce those people into your community if you can't be in contact with them is the question. And it's a real valid and important question. And the answer to that question is so simple and yet so profound. Listen to this. The Pharisees' model of evangelism is this. First, buy into our message and then we'll receive you into our community. First, buy into the message get committed and cleaned up, then we receive you into community. Then we'll sit around a table with you. Then we'll eat with you. Jesus' model is fundamentally different as you see in the story. Right? His model is invite the outsider into community so that in the context of acceptance they can explore the message and therefore become an insider. It's hospitality first to everybody, the outcasts, the hated members of society, the sinners. It's extending hospitality to hear the message, to explore the message, and in that process, by God's grace, to become a member of the believing community. Fundamentally different. And if you're tracking with Jesus' metaphor here, just think about this. As Jesus says, listen, guys, how crazy would it be if when you're sick, Before going to a doctor, you have to get better. What? When you're sick, you have to get better before you go to the doctor. makes no sense. That's exactly what Jesus is saying here. In other words, emphasizing the missional impact that hospitality has. And we see Jesus practicing this. Now, before we move on and talk, we're going to talk practically about how to practice this today. In other words, make a rule of life around hospitality. Before we move on, let's not move on too quickly. Because the primary motivation for us to practice hospitality is not just because it's a command. I mean, it is. It's not also just because, hey, you never know, maybe an angel knocking at your door. It's also not even just strategic impact, although it absolutely is. There is a far deeper motivation that we have to talk about. And really, it's, it's just this. We practice hospitality to others because we realize we have been the beneficiaries of God's hospitality to us. We are the tax collectors. We are the sinners. We are the outcasts who Jesus came to, invited us into community, spoke into our hearts, made a way for us to be included into the family of God through his sacrifice on a cross. We are the beneficiaries of God's staggering hospitality. And therefore, we practice hospitality. That's what Romans 15 verse 7 says. It says, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. For the glory of God. Welcome one another. It's the same idea as Christ has welcomed you 
for the glory of God. That's mainly why we do it. To extend to others what we have received, which is the staggering hospitality of God himself. So now, let's talk about how we actually practice hospitality today at these times in this age. And this is going to be immensely practical. So get out your paper and pens. There's four things for us to focus on that are so ordinary, so simple and yet so profound. And that's, that's this idea of hospitality. It's this thing that's so, you know what it is. It's so ordinary and yet could be one of the most important things that we practice as Christians today for the glory of God. So here we go. Four, four things that I've been challenged with that I'm still learning. So number one, just be warm. Be warm. So some of you, if you're like me, introverted, you're like freaking out at this point. You know, don't, don't like push pause or leave the stream just yet, you know, but you're like, man, I can't do this. I don't have the kind of personality. I'm not this charismatic, outgoing, extroverted person. Are you about to tell me that I've got to have these extravagant parties and, and invite all these, you know, people that I don't know? I mean, that's terrifying for any kind of introvert. And hey, here's the thing. You don't need to be those things to be hospitable. You just need to be warm, a, a warm person and being warm is not hard being a warm welcoming hospitable person talking about just personality wise is simply things like smiling you know i was reading you know, research for this and there's lots of articles practical theological all the whole deal and just like simple stuff but you know if you're walking down the corridor in your office block and you have that awkward meeting of eyes, you know, you lock eyes. Oh, what are you, you know, normally like walk with your phone to like avoid eye contact. But if you happen to make eye contact, you'd be the first one to smile. You know, just that's, that's warm. Warm is like smiling, just acknowledging somebody else's presence. Smile, greet people. Guys, this is not rocket science. If you know their names, use them. Use them often. You know, we have this regular coffee shop we go to after, I'll go there far too often. You know, I mean, like you know people, if you know people, you know their names, use their names all the time. It just creates this little culture, this little community. One of the things I was really challenged by, I came across is, uh, you know, if you're walking around a shop looking for stuff, uh, maybe just killing time or there's something you're really looking for and a shop assistant comes to you and go, hey, can I help you? confession for me i like i just try to avoid because i'm like you know what like either i'm just browsing or i know what I, I know what i'm looking for like i don't need i don't need your help you know <laughs> except when i do need someone's help and then they're never around right but generally like i'm fine thank you i try to be polite well how about this instead of just going no it's okay thank you say to the person man how's your day going like just a simple engagement like that 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 one question How's your day going? You're at the toll, checking out, like, you know, instead of just being, you know, polite and, you know, smile at you, but like, just, hey, how's your day going? Asking questions and being willing to listen is like the secret source of being warm. That's all. I mean, this is not hard. Smile, greet people by their names, ask questions. Now, listen, I realize that some of this stuff can be awkward. But you know what? Like as Christians, we have got to realize something. Like awkward never killed anybody, right? It's like who cares about awkward? But you know what? Like people do die eternal deaths because they haven't heard of Jesus, right? So, so that escalated quickly. But, you know, awkward never, like we're just so bound by like in a, a, a fear, an aversion to, to awkwardness. So be warm is just the start of hospitality. Be warm, number two, okay, it gets a little harder, is be intentional. And this is important because the definition of hospitality, remember, is these two ideas of the stranger and the outcast. And so we need to be intentional here. Stranger, by the way, introverts just breathe a little sigh of relief. Stranger does not necessarily mean someone you've never met before. 
doesn't mean you go now, you know, to San City Shopping Center, the first person that walks your way, like this, the Lord's telling me, hey, you want to come to my, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Some of you may be gifted in dealing with people you've never met before, but what the stranger means is people outside of your normal circle, the circle that you are already familiar with, that you are already comfortable with. Stranger means somebody outside of that. And more particularly, it does get a little bit harder, but more importantly, stranger in this context, a xenophilia, right, the love of the stranger, is kind of an opposite to the love of a Christian brother or sister, Philadelphia. But it's the opposite. So the love of the stranger is particularly reaching out to being intentional with those who are not yet Christian. That's why it's missionally strategic. By definition, stranger those who are not yet inside of Christian community, but being warm and hospitable and, and inviting them. So to be clear, let me try and make some distinctions here. F- familiar language. Entertaining. Entertaining is you hanging out with people you would ordinarily hang out with that you're ordinarily comfortable with, and you do it just for the sake of friendship to fill your own tank, and that's great. But that's important. That's entertaining. Fellowship, what we use in church circles a lot, and for a reason. Fellowship is intentionally hanging out with Christian brothers and sisters to do one anothering, to build each other up, to pray. I mean, incredibly important. Entertaining is one thing. Fellowship is another thing. Hospitality is different to both of those two things. It's taking a stranger or an outsider and through friendship and through serving them, inviting them into community that by God's grace they may explore the message of Jesus and become part of the fellowship one day. See, far too many of us view our homes and we have to think about our homes in this context. We view our homes as a shelter for our family and nothing else. And if we crack open the door to our houses, then, then it's only to those like a few close friends. But I was really challenged by this. God has given us homes for two reasons. One, as a shelter for our family. Two, as a tool for ministry. That's what this biblical idea of hospitality leans towards. So that's the idea of stranger. And then you've got outcast. And I want us to just think a little bit about outcast and what outcast means today. See, because even then, stranger means inviting somebody not yet in the faith into a kind of hospitable, uh, friendly, uh, you, know, you know what I mean, hospitality, inviting them in. But even then, the challenge is it's easier to do that with people who are like you, who have similar interests, similar culture, similar worldviews. So it's, it's easy if I think about just some of my friends and school friends that I still hang out with, not yet believers, man, it's, it's, it's practicing hospitality, but it's comfortable, they're like me, it's good. But the idea of the outcast takes it a step further because the idea of the outcast is being hospitable towards those who wouldn't normally fall into what you would describe as acceptable community. You would normally hang out with them. It would be difficult for you to hang out with them. That's what an outcast is. And because it's a challenge, that's why they are often on the fringes. So the question for today is, who would outcasts be today? And particularly for you. I mean, I think, I think outcasts today, so the context of strangers, religious skeptics, absolutely. How about the lower class for you? Or the wealthy class for you might be challenging to be in a neighborly relationship with. How about other races? See, as I go through this list, the idea is to be challenged. Like, who is God challenging you to reach out to as an act of hospitality? Because the idea of Jesus and the tax collectors and sinners, strangers and outcasts. So other races... 
those with different political views. So I read that one in the context of the United States where, man, policy is so polarized. It would be a crazy hard challenge. How about even this? Teenagers. And some of you are watching, but, you know, somebody's making a sign like this in the background of the studio. Now, yeah, because that's the idea is that, you know, teenagers are seen as challenging to hang out with for some people, like threatening. Don't know how to engage. That's exactly the idea. Teenagers or how about the opposite end of the scale, the elderly, who often most on the fringes, especially today in this context of isolation. How about Sexual minorities, a massive subject we'll talk about one day. But this Rosaria Butterfield that I quoted to you earlier comes out of lesbian community and what brought her out and into saving relationship with Jesus Christ was hospitality. If you go read her book, it's brutal, but it's how hospitality saved her. And she calls this hospitality ground zero for reaching that part of our community. How about those with physical or mental disabilities? I mean, that's not comfortable. That's not easy for most of us. Addicts, wild party people, for you introverts, how challenging is that? Or socially awkward people, for some of you, how hard would it be to engage with them? People with traumatic backgrounds? Or how about this, devout, devout members of other religions? See, when you really think about hospitality in the Bible, this is how it stretches. Strangers, so kind of outside of the fellowship, and outcasts, people often left on the fringes, and the challenge of hospitality is through warmth and relationship, inviting them into community to explore the message of Jesus and by God's grace, become part of the community and the fellowship. So who, who is God challenging you to be hospitable towards number three be an initiator so i'll say this moving towards hospitality means moving towards risk which again as christians we're very awkward averse and we're very risk averse but that's the whole christian life is moving out of our comfort zones but particularly with hospitality. I mean, you might even know this in the context of your friends. You might be like, man, I haven't seen that person in a while. I really want to hang out with them. But you're like, I don't know if I should message them and invite them because what if they don't want to see me? What if they're busy? I don't want to impose on them. It's like there's this whole like, element of maybe they don't want to see me anymore. So maybe you're challenged by this and you want to make a new friend, you know, but you're like you're too hesitant to ask to like send that, that message because of the risk. Well, you know, when we don't initiate a relationship with somebody on the outside of our normal circles, when we don't do that, what we're saying is this. We're saying, if you want to befriend me, you take the risk. If we're not willing to initiate, what we're saying is, if you want to befriend me, well, you take the risk. See, but hospitality means the opposite. It means I'll be the risk taker. I'll take responsibility for our relationship. You know, since we're disconnected, I'll connect us. To be hospitable means to initiate. And to be sure there's risk there. But that's why in another verse talking about hospitality, Romans 12 verse 13 says, Seek to show hospitality. Pursue it. It doesn't automatically happen. You know, kind of room where other people are. The idea is not to loaf around and wait for the Holy Spirit to stir someone else to initiate with you. That's unlikely to happen. Be an initiator. Which is hard, right? And this is simple, but not easy, like with a lot of these habits. You're not going to naturally feel like doing this. So John Piper says on this, he says, Therefore, the most natural thing in the world is to neglect hospitality. Of course, it's less awkward, it's less risk, it's less time-consuming. It is the path of least resistance. All we have to do 
is yield to the natural gravity of our self-centered life and the result will be a life so full of self that there's no room for hospitality. Lastly, number four, open your table. This idea of hospitality in the Bible does extend often, almost always, to the idea of eating, to the idea of eating together. And it's funny, if you trace Jesus' movements in the gospel, you'll often see these profound moments around food. In fact, one commentator commenting on Luke's gospel, where apparently there's a lot more instances of food and Jesus eating, even says this, which sounded sacrilegious, but he says Jesus literally eats his way through the gospel of Luke, right? But there is this idea of this constant community and interaction around a table, around meals together. And the power of that, so again, kind of bringing this together, inviting people into your home. I mean, if you have that opportunity around a meal, just so much happens. The mood of atheism can be disrupted by the presence of hospitality in a home. And it doesn't have to be an amazing meal. I mean, it can be peanut butter sandwiches because that mood is disrupted by the warmth of your hospitality. And I've seen this like a little bit. So Kristen's family, you know, mom and dad in the States, so in the South, the Bible of the South is this culture of hospitality. And, you know, I've been there many times where apparently there's other people that have been invited into their homes to have a meal together. Her mom's a wonderful cook. And so there's this meal and her dad will just like, there's warmth. That's great. Her dad will always then, it comes time for grace. This is interesting around a meal. It's Christians. We always say grace, but he, he won't just like recite a prayer. He'll pray for the person, like a long prayer for the person, like not particularly a Christian. And like I've received those prayers. And here's the thing. The staunchest atheist in the world, I believe, <laughs> will still gladly just receive your prayers. I mean, they may think you're weird and not believe in who you're praying to, but like that warmth of asking on your behalf. So when you have people around and at the table, it's just, it's natural. Like if it were at my house, like our kids are so used to saying grace. Like if we don't, if we like forget Benjamin and Emma Rose are both like, we say, we're great, we're going to pray. So imagine that like, we have people over and we're like, oh, these people aren't Christian. So we're not going to say grace just in case it's awkward. Benjamin, we go, hey, we need to pray. And then what would be more awkward for me to go, no, Benjamin, we're not going to pray for these people because they don't believe in God. So we can't, you know, pray for them. He'd go, but why? It'd be like, that's far more awkward than just literally going, hey, we normally pray together as a family before the meal. I'd love to pray for you if that's okay. And then pray. You know, that, that's the idea is hospitality on its own as an act of inviting people and often around a table disrupts the mood of atheism, provides a context for exploring the message of Jesus, perhaps over time. To the point where then it becomes Christian community. One last little comment on that. It doesn't always have to be meals in your home. And I say that particularly for perhaps those who are, you know, single out there or don't have the opportunity to invite people or it's not, you know, your house. Even just being intentional about having lunch at work with your colleagues. But instead of you know, eating at your desk or whatever, or, or just with your circle, just being intentional about having lunch with your colleagues. Again, it's around the table. It's non-Christian people. How effective that could be. So church, we're going to pray now and kind of pray to, you know, the gospel, the message of Jesus that this saturates our hearts and that we can practice this but i want to kind of pray just in a way that's whole series that we actually live out this thriving christian life with these habits sustaining us they don't make these things happen in our lives but by god's grace actually transform so let's let's pray our dear god and heavenly father we ask that Here we come before you as those who have been recipients of your outrageous hospitality to us. You came to find us outsiders, outcasts, sinners, and invited us into relationship with you and made a way to be part of your family that involved your suffering and death on a cross. And we thank you, Jesus. And we pray that that on its own would, by your grace, transform us into a warm, welcoming, hospitable people. Challenge us to see who the outcasts are, who the strangers are that we could invite into community. And by your grace, 
that they may become brothers and sisters, part of our fellowship. And God, we pray that these habits, these areas of our lives, that, that you would truly transform us, that we actually live this stuff out and not just the result of the structures, but by your grace having over time made this a reality in our lives, that we willingly, joyfully, naturally, empowered by your grace, live out this Christian life in these particular challenging circumstances. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon from Rosebank Union Church. If you've enjoyed this message, please feel free to share it with others. And if you would like to support the work of Rosebank Union Church, please visit the giving link on our website at ruc.org.za.